So that's great, excellent safety, low cost, wide availability. Let's look at the conclusions here. Our study suggests that NAC inhibited oxidative stress and reduced the inflammatory factors in pneumonia. Treatment with the antioxidant NAC might reduce oxidative and inflammatory damage in pneumonia patients. Now the only thing that remains to be done is to repeat this study with an adequate dose. 1200 milligrams for active treatment is inadequate. Let's look at another study here. So this is actually just a case report. This is from Annals of Internal Medicine, 2010, published in May. I provided a little bit of an image, not the entire article here, but uh, I did provide you some of the uh, excerpt there. This is a 40-year-old woman with H1N1 influenza pneumonia, septic shock, respiratory failure treated with various drugs and antibiotics, even though no bacterial infections were found. That's still basic protocol. So in hospital settings, if a patient comes in with severe pneumonia, septic shock, they're going to get put on antibiotics while we're waiting for the culture results because there's just no time to waste. We can't sit around waiting on test results while this patient's crashing and crumping right in front of us. So the fact that they started antibiotic drugs, even though the patient didn't have a bacterial infection, that's certainly consistent with appropriate care. At that time, the patient was started on NAC intravenously at 100 milligrams per kilogram. So let's assume that this patient weighed, I don't know if it's stated in here, but let's assume this patient weighed 70 kilograms. This would have been seven grams per day of NAC. Now, seven grams is very different from the previous study that we just looked at, where they used 1200 milligrams for community acquired pneumonia. So in this case, we're looking at a more severe disease. This patient's already in septic shock and respiratory failure. So again, they used 100 milligrams per kilogram IV for three days, 100 milligrams per kilogram, let's assume she weighs 70 kilograms, that's seven grams per day for three days. Then they withdrew the high dose NAC and they put her on oral therapy with NAC at 600 milligrams twice per day, so 1,200 milligrams. So, of course, no surprise, the patient crashed after that. So, patient responded very well to 7 grams per day. Then, when they reduced that to 1,200 milligrams per day, the patient crashed. Then, they reinstated the 100 milligrams per kilogram, and the patient was cured of her septic shock, pneumonia, and H1N1, and went home after 20 days. So, even though this is only a single case report, you can follow the patient's clinical response following each of the interventions. And what changed the course of this patient's clinical condition was the intravenous NAC at 100 milligrams per kilogram, which for her probably came out around seven grams per day. So she was crashing when she was treated only with drugs. They gave her the NAC, she recovered. They switched her to oral low-dose therapy, and she crashed again. They gave her the intravenous NAC at high dose again, 7 grams per day, and then that's what saved her. So, again, even though it's an N of 1 or a single case report, the fact that her case went downhill, uphill, downhill, and uphill, with each uphill improvement coinciding with the administration of high-dose NAC, that's what shows you that NAC is what saved the day here. So interesting and successful case, very supportive data. And the authors also note, and I'll just mention it for the sake of completeness here, NAC is pregnancy category B, which means no obvious risk per animal studies and no strong data either for or against in humans. Pregnancy category B includes vitamins, acetaminophen, and several other medications that are used routinely and safely during pregnancy. Now let's take a look at this exceptionally great article from the European Respiratory Journal in 1997. This is indeed one of my favorite articles and in fact is probably the single article that most inspired this current presentation. So let's take a look at some of the important details here. Again, European Respiratory Journal, 1997. I think this journal could have and should have changed the course of medical history but, uh, of course, until now at least, it's been buried in relative obscurity for the past 22 years. So let's take a look at some of the details from this article right now. This is a randomized double-blind trial involving 20 centers. So that is, of course, what we would call a multi-center trial, which helps us to have confidence in the results. This wasn't a single university clinic or hospital providing these results. This is 20 different centers. NAC was administered at 600 milligrams twice per day for six months 
in elderly and somewhat unwell patients. Influenza H1N1 seroconversion was not changed. Now, when I first read this article back in about 2009, so about 10 years ago when I first read this article, that was a bit confusing to me, even though now it's obviously not confusing to me. So the answer to that is pretty obvious. What I had thought, you know, maybe 10 years ago, is that uh, preventive interventions such as nutritional intervention like this one would have prevented seroconversion because they might have blocked acquisition of the virus itself. And now, quite obviously, I see that that wasn't the case. So this is very interesting because this level of detail helps us understand exactly how and where in the stream of events NAC actually functions. Does it function at level one, which is acquisition and penetration of the virus? No. Does it function at level two, which is replication of the virus? Probably so. So the action of NAC is less at stage one and more at stages two, three, and four. So that might be uh, more detail and understanding than necessary, but uh, I thought, at least for me, as someone who studies this, I thought that that was interesting. All important clinical parameters improved, signifying major clinical benefit and major financial implications. Frequency of the illness experienced a major reduction. Severity of the illness experienced a major reduction. Repeat illness experienced a major reduction. And all major and minor problems were all reduced by the simple intervention of 600 milligrams twice a day of NAC for a total dose of 1,200 milligrams. Why is that an appropriate dose? Because these patients were not sick to begin with. So this is a preventive dose, just like I've said previously. With prevention, we can use lower doses than we need to use for intervention. At the time patients are already sick, they require much higher levels of intervention, which is why the old saying exists that a ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And clearly, this research and some of the research we've already looked at reflects that. This certainly would be compatible with other treatments such as vitamin D, vitamin A, zinc, selenium, and even vaccination, which I generally think is such a worthless intervention that I don't even know why I put it on the slide. So my comment on this study is that this study should have resulted in additional research and it should have resulted in major changes in healthcare policy internationally. So this is far in excess of the effectiveness and cost effectiveness of the influenza vaccine, far in excess of what you would expect to see with influenza vaccination. And when I say that, I'm also including what would be the expected collateral benefits of this intervention. This level of NAC supplementation would be compatible with lowering homocysteine levels, which would then reduce the risk for cardiovascular disease and stroke. It would also reduce the incidence of major depression, anxiety disorders, other neuropsychiatric conditions due to its modulating effect and neuroprotective effect, especially reducing glutaminergic neurotransmission, as I mentioned previously and as I'll show you toward the end of this presentation. So when you look at all of the combined benefits of NAC in this study group, you would expect to see major reductions in healthcare expenses beyond what was shown here, and that is major reductions in the frequency, severity, and repeat illness of influenza H1N1 in this elderly population. Now let's look at some additional details. Certainly additional benefits would have been found if they had actually looked for those benefits, and if they had followed this treatment with additional time, and also if they had used additional nutrients. So what you see here, from one of the tables in this article is a reduction in total influenza cases, also patients suffering from two or three repeat episodes, and also patients suffering from more than four episodes. So again, reduction in severity, frequency, and repeat illness. That's of major importance, of course. Now let's look at some quotes from the article as I've highlighted here. So basically, NAC helped to reduce all the symptoms and manifestations of flu in these elderly patients. And again, 600 milligrams twice per day, 1200 milligrams total, very safe, very cost effective, widely available, immediately available, does not require millions of dollars of investment in so-called research to produce a new version of the intervention every year. This is readily available. Everybody should have this in their homes 
and in so-called flu season especially, people should be reaching for this, not being subjected to mandatory vaccinations. So again, very excellent article that could have shaped and changed the course of medical history. Obviously, we're going to keep looking at other research. Let's take a break very briefly here for some concepts. By the time patients arrive to the more severe grades of viral infections, such as HIV and AIDS, their catabolism of cysteine is approximately 6 to 7 grams per day. If you know that during an active, acute, systemic viral infection that the catabolism of cysteine is at 6 to 7 grams per day, then obviously you can see why 600 milligrams would be inadequate for an active infection, why 1,200 or even 1,800 milligrams would be inadequate for an active infection. When people have active, systemic viral infections, they need very high doses of NAC, relatively speaking, and you can obviously see again that 600, 1200, 1800 milligrams is inadequate. And this is what I just said. Therefore, we would not necessarily suppose that replacing 10% of that amount at 600 milligrams per day of NAC would be of tremendous benefit. Indeed, the studies that have used NAC 600 milligrams per day generally find modest, but also safe.